Still reeling from the horrors of World War I, France vowed never to be vulnerable to German invasion again. This determination led to the creation of the Maginot Line, one of the most imposing defensive marvels in history. With an investment exceeding 3 billion francs, France built a fortified barrier stretching from Switzerland to Luxembourg. This colossal line consisted of over 500 individual casemates and bunkers, equipped with 135mm artillery and linked by extensive underground tunnels. It stood as an impenetrable shield. Yet by 1937, Hitler was determined to break it. To do that, he would need the most prominent gun in human history. From a long tradition of colossal railway guns, the Schwerer Gustav, or the Heavy Gustav, was conceived a Nazi superweapon so massive and destructive that it would require 500 people just to fire it and about 4,000 more to protect and operate it on the battlefield. Hurling seven-ton shells over 30 miles away as if they were pebbles, the heavy Gustav was a bone-chilling instrument of war. As World War II raged on, the world waited in suspense to see if German engineers could harness its devastating potential or if the largest gun in history would backfire. For centuries, military tacticians adhered to one principle. Superior artillery meant larger guns. However, as the size and scale of these weapons grew, their transportation to the front lines became an increasingly complicated puzzle. In the mid-19th century, Russia, always innovative in its military thinking, proposed a solution. The audacious concept of placing a cannon on a railway car. Figures like Gustav Kory and Pyotr Lebedev detailed this intriguing idea of railway artillery in a landmark publication in 1857. Yet the first faction to practically implement and use this concept in a live battle was the Confederacy during the American Civil War. They innovatively adapted a naval artillery piece, mounted it on a railway chassis, and employed it to assail the Union forces during the Battle of Savage's Station. The strategic ingenuity of this was clear as day. With the industrial age ushering in expansive railway networks across nations, a military power controlling these tracks had the unprecedented advantage of swiftly moving these colossal cannons to any front, as the tide of battle demanded. World War I saw this idea not just being adopted, but flourishing. The Entente powers, realizing the potential, retrofitted their naval guns and fixed fortifications into mobile railborne artillery. Using these weapons, the Allies pummeled the German defensive strongholds along the Western Front. Germany, not to be outdone, responded with their engineering marvels, the pinnacle of which was the awe-inspiring Paris gun. This beastly 211mm cannon had the capacity to unleash 243-pound shells onto the heart of Paris from an astounding 75 miles away, a range that left the French defences virtually powerless. The trajectory of each shell was so high that it took about three minutes to touch down after a brief journey through the stratosphere. While the weapon utilized railways for movement, it required specialized, fortified concrete platforms from which to fire. Tragedy struck on Good Friday 1918, when one such shell destroyed a church in Paris, resulting in 91 civilians losing their lives. This catastrophe was unforeseen. The gun's accuracy was in reality capricious, varying by miles. Confused and terrified, the citizens of Paris, ignorant of this weapon's existence, believed that German zeppelins were mercilessly raining bombs upon them. The Paris gun, despite its limited operational achievements, left a deep scar on the French psyche. A harbinger of the fearsome V weapons of World War II, it also sparked an arms race for bigger artillery. This journey would pave the way for the creation of the Gustave. The sheer psychological terror it inflicted was evident when the Treaty of Versailles, which marked the end of World War I, specifically singled out and banned the possession of such heavy artillery. The treaty demanded Germany surrender a fully functional Paris gun, but Germany, in its signature defiance, never gave up the weapon. Krupp's brilliant engineers revisited the design, fortified the barrel and increased its caliber from 21 to 28 centimeters. This modification notably enhanced accuracy, although it curtailed its range to a still impressive 40 miles. They named this revised artillery gun the K5. The German military vision soon aspired for something even more monumental, a railway gun of unparalleled size and power. But dreaming it and building it were two very different challenges. 
Following the Great War, France's foremost priority was preventing a recurrence of the devastating invasions it endured during World War I. The scars of the German onslaught, the nightmarish trench warfare and the staggering loss of life were indelibly etched into the collective memory of both the French citizenry and its military hierarchy. Military strategists of the era posited that the key to avoiding a repeat catastrophe was timing. If France could decelerate an invading force long enough for its allies to mobilize, it would effectively negate any chance of a German triumph. Enter the Maginot Line, a tangible manifestation of France's defensive posture aimed at both dissuading Germany from future incursions and affording France a tactical upper hand should conflict erupt. The initiative derived its name from André Maginot, the French war minister in the late 1920s, who fervently championed its inception. Yet, constructing such a prodigious bulwark was no trivial task. The financial commitment to the Maginot Line was colossal. Spanning a decade from the late 1920s to the late 1930s, the endeavour drained approximately 3 billion French francs from the national coffers, a staggering expenditure for the era. Modernised equivalencies, accounting for inflation, technological leaps and various other parameters, place this in the ballpark of several billion US dollars, although precise figures shift based on the chosen conversion metrics. The line was an architectural marvel, extending over 280 miles from Switzerland to Luxembourg. It was an intricate web of bunkers, forts, artillery stations and more. Deploying vast reserves of concrete, steel and labour, the fortifications also harnessed cutting-edge tech of the epoch, including modern ventilation for its subterranean passages. The choice to halt the Maginot Line at the French-Belgian border was complex and highly debated. There were diplomatic hesitations concerning Belgium's neutral stance, a strategic reliance on the Ardennes forest as a formidable natural barrier and financial constraints. Amidst the economic concerns of the Great Depression, extending the fortifications across the expanse of France's eastern border was a fiscal impossibility. Initially, the towering defence structure functioned as envisioned, serving as a deterrent and a strategic quandary for a rising Hitler. If he aspired to annex France, overturn the Treaty of Versailles and secure Lebensraum or living space for the German populace, the imposing Maginot barricade stood in his path. Yet, the line also fostered a detrimental sense of complacency among the French population. This false sense of security left France ill-equipped for the coming battles. By the late 1930s, Hitler meticulously evaluated his strategic options. A potential thrust through the Ardennes following a Belgium and Low Countries invasion, a head-on charge at the Maginot Line, or revisiting the Schlieffen Plan, which melded elements of both strategies. One conclusion loomed large. Should Germany even consider a direct assault on the imposing Maginot Line, an unprecedented artillery marvel capable of decimating the line's robust defences from miles away would be needed. Germany would need the Schwerer Gustav. The Oberkommando des Heeres, or OKH, Germany's Army High Command, collaborated with the renowned Essen weapons manufacturer Friedrich Krupp AG to design a gun capable of obliterating the forts of the Maginot Line. The stipulations were clear. The gun's projectiles must penetrate at least one meter of steel armor or seven meters of fortified concrete, all while maintaining a safe distance from counterfire. Entrusted with this daunting task was Krupp's engineer, Erich Müller. After thorough calculations, Müller deduced that this new weapon would eclipse all prior artillery in sheer size and power. His blueprint outlined an 80-centimeter caliber behemoth with a 30-meter long barrel to launch seven-ton shells. Such a monstrosity was projected to tip the scales at over 1,000 tons, posing significant mobility challenges. Krupp's solution was an ambitious system of dual railway tracks for transportation. Mirroring the smaller railway gun designs, this mount would only adjust the barrel's elevation. To aim, the weapon would have to be strategically repositioned along curved railway sections. The proposal to the OKH encompassed variations with calibers ranging from 85 centimeters to a staggering one meter. Intriguingly, in line with German weapons procurement customs of the era, Krupp offered to produce the first gun free of charge, with costs to be negotiated only for subsequent units. However, the OKH remained non-committal. The project teetered in limbo until a fateful day in March 1936, when Hitler toured Essen. Inquiring about the gun's viability, he expressed a preference for the staggering one-meter caliber of unbridled destructive prowess. However, 
Preliminary analyses showed that expanding to a full meter caliber would amplify the already significant developmental challenges. The increased caliber would increase the weight and place even greater stress on both the barrel and its mount upon firing. Moreover, larger calibers required heftier ammunition, meaning a one meter caliber gun would need even heavier and more unwieldy projectiles. Transporting and handling such immense ammunition for the one meter design would drastically intensify the logistical challenges, especially when the smaller 80 centimeter variant was already a daunting endeavor. Furthermore, practicality prevailed. The primary goal behind the Schwerer Gustav was to counter the fortifications of the Maginot line. An 80 centimeter caliber was deemed apt for the job, rendering the one meter variant an extravagant overreach. Hitler greenlit the 80 centimeter Schwerer Gustav's production in 1937, earmarking a staggering 10 million Reichsmarks for the venture, approximately $67 million in today's currency. Production on the Schwerer Gustav began in 1937, with an expected completion in 1940. However, challenges in sourcing the vast steel sheets delayed its initiation. By late 1939, a test model was crafted, and Krupp dispatched it to Hillesleben for evaluation. Impressively, the gun penetrated a meter of armor and seven meters of concrete with just one high elevation shot. Testing wrapped up in 1940, after which the carriage underwent several enhancements. In 1941, Hitler and Alfred Krupp convened at the Rugenwalder Proving Ground to validate the Schwerer Gustav's prowess. The Oberkommando des Heeres ordered two of these colossal cannons. The inaugural gun roared to life on September 10th from a temporary carriage. Later, in Poland, it showcased its might by launching a 7,100 kg shell almost 40 kilometers from its target. Yet, as anticipated, the monumental task lay in moving this behemoth. It demanded extensive alterations to significant sections of Germany's railway infrastructure to accommodate such a formidable weapon. Tipping the scales at 1350 tons and stretching over 47 meters, the gun was a structure too heavy for a lone standard railway track. Such a track might have buckled or snapped beneath its colossal weight. By using two parallel tracks, this immense weight was distributed more evenly, alleviating stress on the railway infrastructure. The dual-track approach offered a wider base, ensuring optimal stability during both transport and firing. This stability was crucial. Minor shifts could lead to major targeting inaccuracies due to the artillery's extensive range. To achieve this dual-track setup, the German government delved into meticulous planning and engineering. They revamped existing railways and laid new tracks, preparing the path for the gun's voyage to the Eastern Front. This endeavor often required strengthening bridges and bolstering the rail system. Additionally, specialized rail cars were designed to carry the gun and its parts. A battalion-sized crew of roughly 2,000 soldiers was needed for assembly, operation and upkeep. In battle, this number could surge to 4,000. However, the monumental effort bore fruit. The Schwerer Gustav stood as a pinnacle of German engineering, poised to breach French defenses. Its barrel, spanning over 100 feet, overshadowed all others of its time. Its structure dwarfed any Allied or Axis vehicle or artillery piece. Mounted on a chassis with eight sections, it boasted 80 wheels, all transported on two parallel tracks. Its shells were equally unprecedented in scale and mass. Towering over two average men, it weighed a formidable 20,000 pounds. To breach the Maginot Line's fortifications, this heft was essential. But this also meant that a team was indispensable for loading the Schwerer Gustav. During a 1941 test at Hillesleben, Holmes, kilometers away, reportedly suffered structural harm due to the gun's thunderous shock waves. Alfred Krupp, Gustav's son, proudly showcased the weapon to Hitler at the Rugenwalder Proving Ground. By early 1941, its production received official approval. Despite the massive investment and meticulous development of the weapon, the imposing German gun wasn't battle-ready when Hitler sought to breach the Maginot Line. Consequently, Germany had to conquer France without its might. Ultimately, Germany opted for a bold invasion through the Ardennes, skillfully bypassing the robust Maginot Line. The unprecedented success of the Blitzkrieg strategy in France, which hinged on swift armoured units and aerial aid, rendered such a gargantuan, slow-loading artillery redundant. 
The Schwerer Gustav was designed for a distinct wartime strategy. It demanded custom railway tracks for transport, intricate assembly, and considerable time to prepare for firing. This stood in stark contrast to the dynamic warfare deployed in France. The German forces needed agile, versatile weapons to bolster their swiftly advancing troops. Even with Germany's earlier conviction that a monumental weapon was imperative, they swiftly subdued France. The rapid German advance caught the defensive forces off guard, partly because they were overconfident in the Maginot Line's seemingly impenetrable defences. Although the initial objective for the Schwerer Gustav was met without its firepower, Hitler yearned to showcase his mighty invention on the battlefield. He was determined to prove to the world Germany's unparalleled engineering prowess and their audacity to wield it. The siege of Sevastopol provided the perfect backdrop for such a demonstration. The heavy artillery unit E-672, along with the colossal gun, was dispatched to Crimea. This massive weapon, transported by a 25-car train, journeyed to the Isthmus of Perikop by early March, pausing until April as the bespoke railway track was constructed. Come April, the Schwerer Gustav was stationed on the new tracks, stretching from Simferopol to Sevastopol. For the first time, the mightiest gun ever built was ready to roar, preparing it for action took five weeks, marshalling the efforts of 4,000 personnel. Its inaugural firing occurred on June 5th, involving 500 soldiers in the operation. The Schwerer Gustav's deployment was a monumental endeavour. Once on site, a level firing position was meticulously prepared, often involving substantial earthworks. The subsequent alignment with its target was an arduous affair spanning several hours, attributed to its immense size and heft. Loading the heavy Gustav was no small feat. Its colossal shells were manoeuvred to the gun's muzzle via a crane system, then meticulously loaded into the breech. Given the sheer size and heft of the projectiles, this task required impeccable synchronization among the crew to ensure a safe and precise loading. The dedicated crew of 500 was a blend of gunners responsible for aiming and firing, technicians ensuring the weapon's functionality, and an array of support staff overseeing ammunition, transportation and various logistical challenges. Every shot fired was a dramatic event. The crew would verify alignment, adjust elevation and azimuth, and ignite the propellant, sending the mammoth shell hurtling toward its objective. The detonation of each round was formidable, as a terrifying eruption of flame and smoke spewed forth with every release. By the siege's conclusion on July 4th, Sevastopol lay in ruins. The Schwerer Gustav had unleashed 48 rounds, targeting and decimating vital points, such as a 98-foot-deep munitions depot, which crumbled under its onslaught. Though it had fired a relatively small number of rounds, the impact was profound. A target like the submerged ammunition cache, previously deemed impervious to conventional artillery, was obliterated. This showcased the Schwerer Gustav as a premier siege tool, capable of breaching fortifications that were otherwise untouchable. However, this triumph bore consequences. After fewer than 50 rounds, the barrel was gravely compromised, rendering it inoperative post-siege. It was subsequently returned to Essen, where a replacement barrel from its accompanying train was fitted. With Sevastopol subdued, the monumental railway artillery was disassembled for transport. Destined for the Northern Eastern Front for a prospective assault on Leningrad, the Schwerer Gustav bided its time nearby through winter, but before it could roar once more, plans changed and the attack was aborted. After the design of the Schwerer Gustav, three more variations were conceived or constructed. Dora, the second gun manufactured and the sole other deployed in combat, was christened after the wife of Erich Müller. Commissioning Dora cost 7 million Reichsmark, translating to 24 million US dollars, as of 2015. In August 1942, Dora was positioned to the west of Stalingrad. However, it wasn't combat ready until September 13th. With the Soviets closing in to encircle the German forces, they decided to retreat, and they evacuated the powerful artillery. The Langer Gustav represented the next iteration. However, it fell victim to British bombing raids over Essen while still being assembled. Designed with a 52-centimetre calibre and a 43-metre-long barrel, its munitions weighed 1,500 pounds and boasted a range of 118 miles. This would have granted the Germans the capability to shell London from as far as Calais in France. Subsequent plans conceived a colossal 1,500-tonne self-propelled armoured vehicle, 
the Landkreuzer P-1500 monster. Designed to be the largest armoured vehicle ever, its projected weight dwarfed even the renowned German Tiger I tank, which weighed in at about 57 tonnes. Envisioned with an 800mm calibre gun, a slightly modified version of the colossal Schwerer Gustav railway gun, the P-1500 aimed to be an unprecedented powerhouse on the battlefield. But the monster's might wasn't restricted to just its primary gun. It was also imagined to wield two 150mm howitzers and a selection of 15mm and 20mm autocannons, primarily for anti-aircraft defence. These features combined to create a leviathan of war. However, its monumental size was both its strength and its Achilles heel. The P-1500's vastness meant it would be an undeniably slow beast, anticipated to reach speeds of a mere 10 km per H. Its thick armour, while formidable, would still leave it vulnerable to the advanced weaponry of the era, especially from the skies. Beyond just the challenges of combat, the practical difficulties in producing, transporting and even deploying such an immense vehicle rendered it almost fantastical in nature. Realising the logistical nightmare and the drain on valuable wartime resources, Albert Speer, in a moment of clarity, cancelled the project in 1943. Speer's decision highlighted a move to concentrate on more feasible and effective war materials, sidelining the tempting allure of wonder weapons, which, while impressive on paper, offered little practical return on the massive investment they demanded. If the monster had transitioned from blueprint to reality, it would have outweighed the heaviest tank ever constructed, the Panzer VIII Maus, by a staggering 500 tonnes.